My name is uh, Matthias Jud. I'm an artist. And since over 20 years, I'm working together with uh, Christoph Lachter. And as artists, for us, the foundation of art is the question on how we perceive this world and how we can express ourselves in this world. And in a digital communication society, our perception and our expression is increasingly happening in the digital. Our work therefore analyzes the power structure of digital communication systems and specific possibilities of expression. One of the narratives of the internet is that every page is just one click away. But digital communication is always computed for access control, for system maintenance, for usability, for commercial or political reasons. Um, so therefore our view is always specific by rating, ranking, routing, and filtering. Here we see censored web pages from Iran, from Thailand, from Switzerland, from the Emirates, from Germany, and from China. How can we compare our views? How can we see what we don't see? One of our projects can send you pictures of the internet from its server's location, making simple but also browsable screenshots of the web page. You can request a picture from a specific web page from another place. And because these are pictures, they also go through the text censorship machines. Together with communities, we extended in another project the country code top level domain space with new specific domains .ku for Kurds, .te for Tamil Ilam, .ti for Tibetans, .uu for the Uyghurs. The Green Movement in Iran in 2009. Tens of thousands of Twitter users turned their profile pictures green in solidarity with the activists. For users of social media, the protests in Iran were an inescapable global story. The Green Movement and this Twitter intervention was called a social media revolution. An inter investigation by Al Jazeera confirmed only 60 active Twitter accounts were actually from within Iran. And Iranian blockers who took part in the process have since poured water, cold water, on the Twitter revolution theory. The protests in 2011 in Tunisia, in Egypt, and so on, were called social media revolutions too. Although the internet was put down during the peaks of the protests. So how to confront this narrative? The internet can be shut down, power can be cut, we can be denied access. How can we do within the digital devices we already have at hand, what can we do with them when the internet is shut down? 10 years ago, in 2011, we started a project called NET to discover and experiment on how we can communicate. Our dependency from infrastructure and the possibilities to build our own spontaneous communication infrastructure with the devices we already have at hand. So let's have a first look into how networks are organized. Usually, we see here a, a classical um, a network structure. So um, we have uh, here um, in the center, the backbone, then we have uh, the uh, servers or uh, access providers, and then um, we have our own computers or the computer um, uh, at the workplace or in a library in a public or in an internet cafe. Um, the same thing is more or less also for the um, digital mobile service providers. So we are always connected 
um, uh, to an antenna of the mobile service provider, and these antennas are then interconnected within uh, uh, their their own web, and then this web is somewhere connected to the internet. So this uh, um, is, of course, a, a structure um, which can, at each point and each machine, also be controlled. This is uh, always the case with technical networks. Uh, each machine that needs to uh, route the traffic can um, and, and needs also for technical maintenance to um, decide what to do with the packages that are coming. So. An alternative possibility would be when we already have um, uh, devices that are capable to um, interconnect themselves with other devices via Wi-Fi, uh, via cable, and so on, um, to interconnect them in a different way. So, for example, when I want to uh, send a message to someone next to me, usually uh, this message uh, in, in the classical network structure uh, travels up the entire hierarchy of uh, uh, the internet, uh, goes somewhere to a server, and then returns to the device the, for the, the person next to me. But of course, if we could directly interconnect the devices, it would, this would be a much um, uh, better and more direct way. And as we can see here on this, this graphics, uh, this is called a mesh network. So a mesh network means that the devices are not only peer-to-peer -peer connected between themselves, but they also um, route the traffic of all the other devices in the network. So uh, for example, this device here you know, is not directly connected with this device here, but it can send uh, a message and this message can go either via this device or via this device or uh, take a very long uh, way um, this way around. So um, all these possibilities that are in this uh, network and as it is meshed together, um, that's why it is called a mesh network. If it's wireless, we call it the wireless um, mesh network. And this can lead also um, to the situation where we can just, for example, take out our SIM card um, of the devices we already have and they still have some functionality. Um, so since 2011, we developed CallNet and the open source uh, software, as we uh, develop it as an open source project. Um, uh, oh, okay, I, I see there is a message that someone cannot see what I am presenting. Maybe, um, uh, do we have some technical assistance here? Okay, it is said in the chat, if you cannot see um, what I am presenting, please um, click in the left scene on the little icon on the bottom right, so next to the hand icon. Okay, so, CallNet is directly interconnecting our um, devices we have, the mobile phones, the computers, and so on, um, without using the mobile networks and the infrastructure that there is already. The app can build its own infrastructure. And can a, um, forward packages from other users, messages from other users to other devices. And, uh, but we can even share also the app itself with other um, devices. So for example, if uh, uh, there is, let's say, an, uh, no internet access um, and, and somebody has the app, um, he or she can um, share this app with the other one. CallNet is an extendable and open network. The neighbors can join too without asking anyone. 
And if somebody in the network has internet and shares it, um, everybody can uh, join in. So this software we built in uh, 2011, and it is the uh, interface also from there. Um, we built it in a multi-language way. There have been, um, I think, over 10 languages. It was a uh, um, translated uh, uh, tool. Um, uh, there is the possibility to uh, to send messages, to see all the other users, to uh, share files, and also to directly call um, other users. And as an internet independent Wi-Fi communication mesh uh, app, um, the other thing was also that we built um, for five different systems. So for for iOS, for Android, for Mac OS, for Linux, and for Windows um, executables and um, installers that you could install directly on your device. Um, yeah, the right. So, Because in the last years, not only the network and the possibilities of surveillance change, but also devices at our hand, they became very complex and powerful machines. This allowed us to set up a system that interconnects Wi-Fi enabled computers and smartphones via software to an internet independent communication network. This independent, redundant, open communication principles gives us an other possibility to communicate. Um, uh, one of the question is in, in what language uh, was this tool developed? So this tool um, was developed the first version in uh, core of C and, and uh, no, there were only 32 bit uh, versions of it. Um, it's uh, still accessible via the GitHub repository. If you check there, it's release 1.0. And uh, the core was built in C, and then um, we had an HTML5 GUI, and um, there uh, was then kind of, yeah, uh, some, some little native code to manage uh, the Wi-Fi stuff on each of the platforms. If you have other questions, just uh, write them in the chat. I try to um, uh, answer them, or you can also open the microphone and... Uh, ask me a question. Yeah, um, if you download the app, uh, so uh, for for Android, it, it needs access to many things, but also um, you need to have a, a, a routed phone. I will come to that uh, later. This is why we are developing right now a new version of it for that you don't need that um, anymore. So uh, at the screen that we see right now is also as this uh, was an, uh, a network, um, which is TCP IP. Um, uh, you can interconnect it uh, via many different ways. So, um, one of the way is, is of course also to to use mini computers or some and to to make really own um, interconnections with it. Um, okay, I'm interested in learning about the security of the app. Yeah, I guess I will come there uh, uh, later because I think this is especially a question which maybe targets now also the new version that we are um, writing because security is one of the uh, main concerns there. Um, how many devices can be connected to the mesh network and through the app? Can this pose some security problems? Example, seeing the data shared through the network. Um, 
that's a really good question. Um, a, it cannot really be said how many uh, devices can be shared. We never had a problem, but of course, everything has a limit. It depends on what people are sharing and doing um, over the uh, network and how close together they are and how well spread the network is. Um, but uh, we can say when uh, when we are looking at the uh, at this technology of wireless mesh networks that there are existing mesh networks um, with uh, several thousand users. So as the, the, the biggest one, as I know, has around 4,000 to 5,000 users and it works well. So, um, okay. Yes, uh, how different is call from tools such as Bridgeify? That's a good question, but I would also um, uh, delay this, uh, the answer of this question um, at, uh, to a bit more the end of the um, presentation to discuss there the, the differences uh, in, in our approach. And there I will also talk a bit more about the new technical approaches. So since then, we have be, been giving um, also workshops on how to build uh, mesh networks. Um, mesh networks are around since some time. Um, there are some open and free um, routing um, protocols. There are several of them. Uh, some of them even made it now into, uh, into some of the, the Wi-Fi products. And uh, you can install with free software uh, a lot of them and can build a network. And with uh, CallNet, you did not only have the possibility to have a, a routed mesh network, but also to have a client that can build the network and can communicate over it. So one of the things in the first version was that we uh, are using Wi-Fi, IBSS mode, and uh, which is a Wi-Fi standard. Um, and the question, one of the questions is all uh, often also how far can it really go? So by um, um, protocol standards, it is 250 meters, but this only if you have um, a line of sight. So there cannot be um, trees or also coated windows or walls and houses and so on uh, in it. If you have a clear line of sight, it's 250 meters. But with the uh, 3D uh, drivers, at least on the routers, you can expand this. And you can also build uh, different antennas, for example, to reach uh, further. And here, a quick test we did uh, in the East Chinese Sea to interconnect this um, a remote island um, with the land. And here we see the view from uh, the land to the island. Here was one antenna and the other antenna was on the island and these were three and a half kilometers. And we managed to bridge it with this self-built um, CAN antennas and Wi-Fi 2.4 uh, gigahertz. Here is, uh, are so, uh, such pictures of um, such antennas. These antennas are really easy to build. And we built it with many people and we had also stable uh, networks running uh, them for, uh, for several kilometers. Uh, you can also use it as cedars and uh, put it into uh, to a dish and then you can even go further. I have here some of the antennas. So the nice thing is with these antennas is this is just really easy for people to know wh where the signal exits. And um, so it's, it's not, it, with many antennas, it's a bit of a question, how should I put it? And this is really easy to put it. You can even build a bit longer antennas and then they are um, further and uh, you only need very little tools to do it. Um, the difference of these antennas uh, in, in, uh, in comparison with such a, a little stick antenna that we often have when we have a Wi-Fi stick is that here the signal is going in a sphere. And when you have a, a CAN antenna, the signal is going into one direction, which means uh, it spreads about in 60 degrees, uh, which gives a significant uh, increase of uh, the range 
that you can reach with such an antenna. And there are also better antennas uh, to build, such as, for example, this one, which is a, a, a double quad um, antenna, a self-built one, also from very simple um, things, uh, like, a, like a copper wire that you that you fold a bit together. And uh, this is even more effective, but it is much more complex to build. And it's also more difficult to really have the right uh, angles and everything for that you have the perfect gain of this antenna. So therefore this, uh, um, these can antennas are really easy and uh, you can almost buy it everywhere in the world. So here we see such a model. Uh, that you can connect to a, a, a normal Wi-Fi stick and that the signal is going into one direction. So some examples on where call uh, has been used all over the world. Um, in 2014, we have been invited in the run-up of the municipal elections in Turkey and in the aftermath of the, the Gezi Park protest um, to Istanbul. And we were asked to uh, kickstart uh, a Wi-Fi mesh network there and to help people build because uh, uh, the censorship uh, changed a lot even uh, during the, the time we were there. And um, so before it was a simple DNS censorship and then afterwards the Turkish state um, took over the entire port uh, 53 and uh, whatever DNS um, resolver you had installed, you always received their um, resolution and their suggestions. At the time there were about, I guess, 30 to 40,000 pages censored at the moment. These are over, um, uh, these are several hundred thousands of pages. So it increased um, once again. And we built there in many workshops such uh, uh, antennas and uh, this was also one of the um, key things to have a bit a longer connection within there to have a resilient uh, network uh, to communicate if the power is shut down or um, the internet is shut down. Um, this is a little thing that we developed together with activists from the Gacy protests. It's a portable and a mobile um, access point. So uh, you can also, without downloading the app, um, communicate via such an access point and you can also share internet via this access point and you have the possibility to create a local um, network and to also interconnect this local network with other um, networks if this um, if the uh, <laughs> The services are not working well, which uh, was uh, apparently often the case. Um, it can, of course, also be the case when many people are in one location, then it usually uh, gets a bit tight. So, yeah, here the explanation of what is what. So, Another example is uh, from the outskirts of Paris. The fate of people living in the makeshift settlements on the outskirts of Paris is hidden and faded from view. It is a vicious circle. It is not poverty, not racism, and not exclusion that are new. What is new is how these realities are hidden and how people are made invisible in an age of allegedly global and overwhelming communication and exchange. Such makeshift settlements are considered illegal and therefore the people living in them don't have a chance of making their voices heard. On the contrary, every time they appear, Every time they risk becoming visible, merely gives ground for further persecution, expulsion, and suppression. 
The French anti-copyright violation and anti-terror laws inhibit uh, that people without a fixed address or without a bank account can have permanent access to the internet. Together with neighbors and cultural institutions, we created a Wi-Fi mesh network which literally interconnected the neighborhood and shared the access to the internet. People got very inventive to create the best possible internet connection. Et voilà, the first evening with internet. The island Lesbos in Greece. We took this picture in 2015 on the Greek island of Lesbos, the hotspot where many asylum seekers coming from Europe stranded. In the background, you can see the Turkish coast. We have been working for years with many asylum seekers and people on the flight, and I think it is very important to remember how data traces can be a blessing or a curse, a blessing when a signal can call for help and a real threat to life when someone is surveyed or hunted in a war zone or on dangerous escape routes. Another example from uh, Berlin, from the Swiss Embassy. Uh, we have been fond to show our work at the Swiss Embassy in this notorious and heavily discussed government uh, district, because the Swiss Embassy is special. It is right um, at the heart of the government district in Berlin, right next to the federal chancellery. And in this government district is the parliament, the German Reichstag, and the Brandenburg Gate. And right next to the gate, there are other embassies, such as the US embassy and the British embassies. And as we learned from the media, these embassies have, have been surveying the entire area uh, from uh, their roofs and, uh, and were listening even um, to the um, smartphone of uh, Angela Merkel. So the British covered it in uh, a little dome and this is the picture of the American embassy where it uh, was uh, behind um, these uh, fake walls. We also put antennas on the Swiss embassies. They were not as sophisticated, most probably, as uh, the antennas that uh, were used by the British and the uh, Americans. They were makeshift can antennas and uh, they provided a free and open a communication network in which anyone who wanted to could be, uh, was allowed to share and send uh, text files or also share um, messages, uh, call people and so on. And then uh, the Academy of the Arts became aware of the project and they um, asked us to build other antennas on their rooftop. And this uh, was in incredibly um, interesting because uh, their rooftop was uh, exactly between the US Embassy and the British Embassy. We called the project, Can You Hear Me? Because when people are spying on you, they, they are also means they are listening to what uh, you are saying. And people could communicate over it and people really participated in this project and over 15,000 messages have been sent. Here are some examples of the messages. Hello world, hello Berlin, hello NSA, hello GCHQ. 
This is the NSA's Achilles heel, open networks. Can you hear me? Please respond. This is the NSA, in God we trust, all others retract. At NSA, do you feel bored from our stupid messages? Agents, what twisted story of yourself will you tell your grandchildren? How to teach a robot voting for a revolution? At NSA, my neighbors are noisy. Please send a drone strike. Anonymous is watching NSA GCHQ. We are part of your organization. Express us. We will shut down. Yeah, but not only people uh, used it. After a few days, uh, there started to appear also files uh, that uh, were classified uh, from uh, the surveillance of um, the, uh, this entire area, which showed that also uh, parliamentarians had um, maybe a need uh, to have an, a free version, an open version to discuss things. So, and now, um, we uh, come to the new part of our development that uh, we started uh, two years ago and uh, that we are pre-alpha and um, you can already, if you're a developer, download and, and uh, build the source code and test it and we should become ready within the next um, month. And uh, the idea is to overcome a, a few things because we had some challenges. Uh, the classical Wi-Fi ad hoc um, mesh networks, they use ad hoc Wi-Fi. Ad hoc Wi-Fi was unfortunately never built into the Google Android phones. There was a hack that we used in the early years um, where you could still enable the phones. Um, but also uh, then, um, also Apple started to really uh, break this, this thing down and we used private uh, APIs in the beginning, which was also a bit hacky. And it meant that you had to um, root and jailbreak the devices. So we want to overcome that. Um, then our C code was over 400,000 lines of code. We wanted to make that simpler because it was really difficult to maintain. And our GUI also had 2,000 lines of code in a simple uh, JS file. Um, so we needed to make that um, easier too. So, and nowadays people are really using the mobile phones for everything thing and many people even don't have an other device than their mobile phone this is how we interact with the world so it has to be mobile first um, so we cannot have administration rights as unfortunately the companies building those phones don't give us this administration rights we cannot uh, um, yeah, depend on the ad hoc mode anymore and we want therefore to put the entire um, routing into user space so we are building a call routing protocol and we are building also identity device based routing. So which means that um, every user is not identified by an IP address, but by an, uh, um, an, a key. This key is a, is a hash of uh, your public key. So it's really easily um, also checkable whether you is you. And so the background of this entire thing is also to have cryptography um, with a public and a private key that you can share in the net. And um, we also want to implement delay tolerant network. So networking, which uh, what does that mean? It means that when um, uh, people are not always connected, you can still send them a message and the network will store it for you and uh, they will get delivered this message the next time um, they are uh, connecting to the net network or uh, some entities are uh, traveling, uh, let's say, physically between different um, locations and they can carry on messages with them for the people in the other locations. So here now, um, how the uh, software structure is done. So the heart of it is, again, libcall. It's this time written in Rust, not in C. Rust is uh, the 
new language from Mozilla that they built um, to make a Firefox safer. It is a, a safe replacement for C, um, which means you cannot have a by design memory, uh, this, this memory uh, overflows and, and all that stuff is checked. Um, it is a bit more difficult to uh, write it, therefore, but uh, it's a much more modern language. You have much less code. You can reduce it by, by a lot. And uh, unfortunately, there are not too many developers at the moment um, that are really writing it, but it's uh, becoming increasingly more popular and uh, Google wants to write stuff in Rust, Microsoft wants to write stuff in Rust and so on. And so it's uh, definitely a security feature and it's a thing also for the future. And it can be uh, compiled uh, to almost every processor tool. So uh, in it, we have, uh, uh, we have some services like chat and feed messages. We have the routing protocol that uh, forwards the messages within the network. And uh, we also implemented lib peer to peer that you may know. Um, and uh, lib peer to peer has uh, an own branch of, of Rust. So we are using this one. Um, it provides us already with uh, the, the entire crypto thing. It is um, very well tested. It is also used for cryptocurrency stuff. Um, and it is therefore uh, very sound uh, to use. Uh, we are, are using uh, the keys and uh, the identities via this library. So this provides us with some um, security. And then uh, the, the new UI is written in Flutter. And we, of course, also have CLI clients to, to run, um, for example, a daemon server somewhere. And then we have connection modules. So uh, we have a LAN module when you are interconnected in a, um, let's say you are all in the same uh, coffee or, or, or company or house, you can communicate over this LAN. Um, of course, this also means that when you are all interconnected with a wireless mesh network, you can communicate or identity devices will find uh, themselves um, automatically over MDNS. Um, we have uh, uh, a BLE, which we are writing right now, uh, BLE communication. Um, over which you can uh, interconnect devices and they can find um, themselves uh, with a bit of lower um, uh, transmission, of course, and with, with more technical problems, let's say, um, than the LAN module, but still there, there, it is a completely off the grid uh, possibility to interconnect. And we have an internet overlay already in place, uh, which means you can access uh, some uh, community service that are already running and, and, and interconnect local communities over them, or you can build your own community service. It's really easy to set up. There is uh, not much to do. You just uh, kind of um, start the server and uh, others can can connect to it. And this also means this is very decentralized. So when you're running your own um, service and only you, you give the accesses to uh, your communities, um, to your own community, then they uh, can access over it. So I guess now here we are also in the in the questions uh, uh, for the security um, of the app, the, the similarity also to other things such as uh, Bridgeify. Um, uh, to Bridgeify, I guess this is um, this is closed source. We are an open source um, uh, software, so there, uh, as far as I understand, with Bridgeify, the idea um, uh, is also to have there. Um, uh, the possibility to make that a market. Um, I still don't really see how you can do that, but um, uh, for us, it's really important to have an open source um, uh, solution. What encryption do you use? Is this ED um, key that uh, we are using, um, uh, the, the ED curve? And um, yeah, from from there, we have the possibility 
to um, A, encrypt messages that are sent directly and to also sign messages. So we have a feed. Uh, the, the purpose of uh, a call net is uh, communication, which means we have always an open channel where everybody can post. And um, in this feed, uh, you only have signed messages for that. You can make sure that uh, the uh, messages are really signed by uh, this person. So maybe here is one of the last slide, um, how the GUI uh, will look like. Um, and we, so we have now new a dark mode and we have a, uh, we have a bright mode, so you can also verify um, uh, users, you can block them, which just means you don't see their messages, but the network will still uh, remain functional. And yeah, the idea um, is to, uh, to have it released next month and then to start from there and um, yeah, uh, implement more services. So if uh, some of you, our developers, are interested in the development, uh, we are really happy for further collaborators. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask. Otherwise, thank you very much. Um, one question, do you have a security documentation such as red model or security enumeration doc? Um, I don't know what security enumeration doc means. So about security documentation, no, um, and not uh, yet. Um, so, but uh, one thing is that it, it should be run then through a red team once we um, are um, our, our alpha um, and the red team will then um, hopefully <laughs> uh, find find box or or uh, not find box and uh, decide what is what is safe and and uh, not and then we should have security documentation um, uh, a list of security features and their purpose uh, no we don't have that, but uh, this is definitely a to do um, for the future. Um, the, the question is always with security: what uh, what is really the thing, uh, the the idea, what you are going for? Because there are even things that maybe exclude themselves a bit. Uh, there is the possibility, for example, to go uh, for anonymity. Then it's the question: well, okay, but you are still um, kind of uh, trackable by uh by your by your id I, identity um although it is not um this identity is anonymous because it is uh it is not related to anything and of course you can delete it and you can just create a new identity and in the future we should also have nodes with several identities so that you uh that, that this is not um a problem and um the security was uh, on the on the core also of uh, of our thoughts uh, when we started to build that app, but always with the communication aspect in mind. So you can always communicate with everyone, even if you have not met them. And uh, of course you can say then it's possible you have a man in the middle attack. Yes, this is possible. Or a person in the middle attack. And um, uh, but still, I guess uh, sometimes communication is better than not to have communication and you can manually, and this is the only thing that kind of really works, you can manually verify other users, you can compare uh, the key, whether you have the right key, and then you can sign them as verify and, and they are clearly marked as verified and you can communicate with them over the system and you are sure that nobody else can see. Um, uh, the the content of the message, what you always can see is, of course, um, the uh, that message was sent if you are in proximity. And uh, this is something which is, yes, if somebody is listening, it, they can see that two devices are communicating, but if you're just monitoring the internet and you are not interconnected with the internet, then nobody uh, can see it. So I guess this was one of the questions before two.
Yes, I agree. Um, it sounds like these are kinds of considerations and trade-offs that should be useful in more detailed user-facing security documentation. I totally agree. Okay, I guess the time is up. And thank you all for joining this. Um, and thanks for all these questions and the active participation. And yeah, I hope to see you all in other sessions in this conference. And if you want to uh, contact me, just write me an email. Um, uh, you will find me on the, uh, or, or write an email to the Colnet project. I will receive it. Thank you very much. <laughs>